from our epistle, be subject one to another in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In these early Sundays after Trinity, we are being taught the rudiments, the fundamental principles of the Christian life. And for the past two weeks, we have been shown that these principles are to be found not in ourselves, but in Christ, who is himself our life. Now, of course, in one sense, these Sundays after Trinity don't really show us anything that we haven't seen before. After all, the whole first half of the Christian year, from Advent to Pentecost, was a showing forth in a form we could apprehend of the one who is the end of all our seeking, implied in the longings of our souls, but unattainable by these desires alone. And yet the journey of the church's year is not complete at Pentecost. We have indeed seen the word made flesh and we have beheld his glory. But if the journey were to end there, with that initial glimpse, we should be left with a journey unfulfilled of a vision of a far off country and indeed the way to that country, but not having traveled the road ourselves. Yet the one who has revealed himself as our way has also made himself known as the truth and the life. He is, that is to say, both our homeland and our way to it. So to travel there is not to discover some new truth, but to dwell more intimately with the truth we have already known. For as the poet says, we shall not cease from exploration. The end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So in this season after Trinity, our faith seeks understanding so that it may continue to seek. And as both faith and understanding grow and are strengthened, so also is the will reordered in its loving. Today we are given this practical work to be done as we begin this whole process. All of you, says St. Peter, be subject one to another and be clothed in humility. Now, of course, we all know or should know that humility is absolutely necessary to our ongoing conversion, for it is the virtue that allows us to acknowledge reality, the reality of who we are and what we are, and of who and what God is, so that we may live in accordance with that reality. Humility is the opposite of pride, pride by which human beings place themselves above what we are. Sinners think ourselves saints. Human beings think ourselves God. And this false elevation of ourselves, pride, is in some sense at the center of all our alienation from God, from ourselves, and from one another. So pride is the first and capital sin. It is the making of ourselves more than we are. It is placing ourselves above our fellow humans and trying to be God. And humility is not self-degradation. Humility is simply the honesty to accept what we are, that we are creatures and that our fellow creatures are our equals and that God, insofar as he is the cause of our being and of our ultimate happiness, is superior to us. But humility cannot be a merely abstract virtue. That is to say, it can't be something we merely think about ourselves. It involves the actual submission of ourselves to another, so that to be clothed with humility must be, in its practical working out, a being subject one to another within a concrete human community. But of course we all know that as well, don't we? Because it's so easy for us to see who's right and wrong in the parable in this morning's gospel. We can see, can't we, just how wrong the Pharisees and scribes are when they murmur against our Lord for eating with tax collectors and sinners. We know, don't we, that the point of the parable is that we're not judging notorious sinners. 
You can't judge notorious sinners. Surely that's obvious to any Christian. It's the scribes and Pharisees that we're meant to judge, isn't it? So it's the scribes and Pharisees within our communities we're meant to challenge. They're the ones in our communities that we need to confront, to convert. And if we can't convert, at least to remove them from any real place of authority. Because we can't be subject to hypocrites. But that's not what St. Peter says. St. Peter is absolutely clear. All of you be subject one to another. Not just be subject to the notorious sinner, to the homeless and the friendless and the needy, but to the self-righteous hypocrite in your midst. After all, we've seen that form of humility before, haven't we? There's nothing really new. We were shown humility on Palm Sunday when St. Paul bid us let the mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, counted it not a prize to be equal to God, but emptied himself and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. To grow in the Christian life is to acquire the mind of Christ, but to have the mind of Christ is to be subject to all, even to those who would quite literally crucify us. And it's not to be subject to them so that we can gain our reward, whether temporal or eternal, but for their sake. But that's really the point of our gospel this morning, isn't it? The scribes and the Pharisees would likely have been quite comfortable with our Lord's statement to his blessed mother that if she would seek him, it must be in his father's house. But the problem was, they could only seek him in his father's house, so long as that only meant his father's house in the literal, historical sense. In this temple, in this city, in this temple and city in which we are in control, what they cannot see, but what we must see, is that the publicans and sinners are themselves his father's house. But even this is, relatively speaking, easy. It's easy enough to seek the outcasts of society in a parish drop-in on our day off, even to take a meal with a notable sinner in our community as an act of so-called charity. But to be subject, really, truly subject, to those we call our friends in the day to day, that is much more difficult. How often do we avoid the awkward conversation because it induces anxiety? Or avoid asking our friends for help in discerning our own future because we're afraid that they have already decided that the right answer isn't the one we've spent so much time convincing ourselves of, even though we've never actually asked them what they think. True freedom? True freedom is not to be autonomous. It's not to be sitting over there working out our own problems until we're ready to re-engage with our neighbors on our own terms. True freedom is subjection. Subjection to Christ. But Christ can only be found in concrete subjection to our neighbor because he is already within them and subject to them. If we want proof of that, we need only stir up our memories to what we have already seen. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. No, he could not save himself. That would have been contrary to his nature as God and would have been to enslave his human nature to unreality. The power of God is not shown forth to us in some private divine glory, but in the crucifixion of God upon an instrument of torture by and for the sake of his creatures.
That is the concrete form of love we are meant to gaze upon in this season and always. Because that is the love we are meant to learn. All of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, gave up the spirit. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time.